My name is Michael Waymeyer, and I'm a professor at the uh, University of Kansas in the Department of Special Education, and I direct the Kansas University Center on Developmental Disabilities. And what I'd like to talk about today uh, is the issue of self-determination and why it's important to people uh, with developmental disabilities, and, and perhaps to argue that this is something that's critically important for all youth, and in fact all of us, and that uh, but perhaps particularly so for people with developmental disabilities and other disabilities who are frequently marginalized and, and have fewer opportunities and experiences uh, that enable them to lead self-determined lives. So I'd like to begin this conversation about issues of self-determination by, by uh, talking about the expectations that are held for people with disability uh, people with developmental disabilities uh, and, and the issues that come into play when we talk about uh, uh, what we expect about and for people uh, who have disability, but also uh, to set an expectation for how we think about these issues of self-determination that I'm going to talk about. And I want to do that by telling you about a woman, um, a woman named Ruth. Uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth's history is is like many histories you might read uh, pertaining to people uh, with more intensive support needs and whose, whose disability has uh, multiple impacts uh, on her life. Uh, so let me just tell you a little bit about Ruth. Ruth was born with cerebral palsy. Um, she has severe muscle spasms that affect both her arms and her legs. Um, and has seizures that are only partially controlled by medication. Um, Ruth has trouble breathing, eating, and swallowing, so obviously needs lots of support, quite intensive support, uh, the assistance of a, a personal care attendant or a, a support person to, to engage in activities as common as eating. Uh, she has, she, she's not able to walk and she typically sits in her wheelchair or she's transferred into her bed. Um, she's never spoken, um, but she makes some sounds and uh, she can't do the kinds of things, feed herself, uh, bathe herself, uh, get dressed on her own that uh, many people take for granted. So again, needs support to do that. And really no one knows how uh, smart Ruth is because the types of ways that we measure intelligence, whatever intelligence is, uh, are simply inappropriate uh, for people like Ruth. Um, so, you know, so she has a number of challenges in her life. And many of us, in, in whatever role we're in, whether you're a parent, or a family member, an educator, a social worker, a vocational rehabilitation counselor, any number of, of support uh, uh, roles, you know, you, you, you take a look at thinking about Ruth and people like Ruth, and, and you have to begin to answer questions. Why, where, where, where will Ruth live when she leaves school, for example? You know, during the school year, she's receiving uh, free appropriate public education. Where is she going to live after that? With whom should she live? She, she probably lives at home with her parents or somewhere else. What day activities could she take place in? And what kinds of services will Ruth need? And we answer these kinds of questions based upon our expectations for people like Ruth. We answer these kinds of questions based upon our experiences with people uh, like Ruth. And we answer these questions based upon our knowledge of what is in the system and what other people have achieved. But what I want to do is answer these questions as Ruth answered them, because I didn't fabricate Ruth. Ruth is a real person. She was the co-author of a book that was titled, I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes. And the title refers to the fact that although Ruth had no systematic uh, communication system for many years. She was uh, 
befriended by a speech and language therapist who sat down with her at the time she was living in an institution for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And this speech and language therapist said, let's get some basic communication things going. And as is the case in, in many cases, the first thing you establish are ways that a person can communicate yes or no. And the only volitional movement that Ruth had control over was her eye movement. And so she would raise, her, she would literally raise her eyes, look up to say yes, and look down to say no. So, so the book is I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes. Stephen Kaplan, the co-author, is the speech and language therapist that I told you about. And Stephen began working with Ruth and uh, Ruth's opportunities to experience a fuller, richer life than that available inside the institution began to emerge as she began to be able to communicate and as other things began to happen in her life. So where will Ruth live? Well, uh, she lives independently in her own home, a home that she owns in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, she moved from the Belchertown State Hospital or State School uh, in 1978 after she'd lived there for uh, 16 years through her uh, uh, youth um, and into her early uh, adulthood. She moved out as a, as a young adult and, and she moved from first into kind of a halfway house, uh, an apartment that had a number of, of other people moving out of the institution and finally into a, a, a real apartment and then eventually into uh, her own home. Um, and in one of those uh, two infrequent ironies in life, uh, Ruth was the keynote speaker at the 1989 closure of the Belchertown Hospital or State School. With whom should she live? Well, she lives with her husband, Norman. Um, after securing her freedom and uh, shedding all the restrictions that the system would uh, put on her, she married a longtime friend, Norman, who, who just so happened to have also lived at the institution. Um, and she says in the book that, you know, they live together and enjoy occasional, though not too frequent visits from their in-laws. Their in-laws live far enough away so that they're not hovering over them, but close enough that they can watch and feed the cat if they need them to. So. Um, and what's Ruth going to do during the day? Well, Ruth uh, travels. Um, She's a lecturer, she's an author, uh, she's an advocate, she's a frequent keynote speaker. Uh, I had the pr privilege of uh, hearing Ruth speak at a conference in the mid-1990s. By that time she was using um, an augmentative communication device called a liberator that is synthesized speech and so she was able to uh, communicate in ways that uh, uh, were more you know, easy for others to understand. You know, but she, she does a lot of other day activities. When we think of day activities and people with uh, disability, we tend to think about these kinds of, you know, going to the day program or the day hab or whatever else. We, we too frequently or we too infrequently think about things like going to a real job for real pay or uh, going to see a movie or doing the kinds of things that are the kinds of things that fill our days. So, you know, she likes to go out and do things. She does the same kinds of things. She likes to hang around the house and watch the, the Patriots play football on Sundays. Uh, many of the same things. And what kinds of services? Again, we tend to think about uh, services as being disability specific, vocational rehabilitation, you know, uh, case management, um, you know, the various systems that are often important uh, to support people with disabilities. But really, Ruth isn't out of the institution and, and isn't uh, uh, living a rich, full life because the system got her to that point. She is doing this because she surrounded herself with people who are her friends, uh, most of whom don't have disabilities, but who, be, who formed circles of support and, and planned ways that Ruth could move and ways that Ruth could achieve the, the goals that she had and the dream that she had for her life and not just fulfill the system's uh, goals for someone like Ruth. Um, 
And if you know anything about the lives of people with disability, particularly people with developmental disabilities, uh, you will know that without friends and family, it becomes very difficult to live rich, full lives in the community. Friends and family are essential to this and are often more important than, than the types of systems we typically think about. But she does need the types of, of uh, kind of disability specific things that uh, help her. Obviously she still has a number of motor and other issues that that she simply can't perform. So she and Norman both need a personal care attendant. Um, uh, for them it's, and for many Americans, it's important that that person be hired and can be fired by them. There's a, a crisis in America today around the issue of personal care attendants and, and, and uh, the lack really of, of control people with disabilities have over people who come into their lives and do very, very personal things to them. Um, you know, she needs a little luck to win the lottery, don't we all? Um, she needs more money than Social Security provides. Uh, she's eligible for SSI and SSDI and all these acronyms that provide some level of support. But again, if you know anything about disability, you know that those are rarely enough to even live off of. And, and people who, uh, who subsist on these kinds of uh, governmental programs and funding subsist at a poverty level in our nation. People, you know, they're, they're about every five years there's a report that comes out that, that makes the bald statement that the best definition of disability in America is unemployed. Uh, and you could expand that to be poor. Uh, this, these are often the poorest segments of our society. And that says nothing about the capacity of people uh, to be able to perform. It, lives, it says much more often about the opportunities that are available to them um, or the lack thereof. Um, you know, she needs uh, the state of Massachusetts to repair potholes from the winter storm. She needs a mix of things just like you and I need a mix of things. She needs public transportation. She needs this and that. So when we think about the kinds of supports that uh, enable people to live self-determined, rich, full lives, we've got to go beyond just disability supports. We need to think about how to, to uh, 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 involve the community, to circle people with friends, and to build supports that, that go beyond just those disability kinds of things. Although the disability kinds of supports are an important piece of the puzzle, but it's only a piece of the puzzle. So when we think about expectations, I don't know about you, but had I been in charge of planning Ruth's life, I'm guessing that it would have been much less rich, uh, much less full, uh, and she would have achieved, achieved much less than uh, she did. Um, and I think that we need to learn from the fact that really if you go back into the literature from uh, earlier this century even, but I'm sorry, yeah, uh, and, and into the 1990s, into the 1980s, into the 1970s, what you will see as you trend upward is that at any point in time the expectations for what people with disability could do, particularly people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, the expectations that are communicated in that body of literature at that point in time, 10 years later, people far exceeded them. The fact that we're speaking about issues of self-determination for people with intellectual and developmental disability at this point is testimony uh, enough to that. Um, and I have no doubt that 10 years from now, we're gonna look back and we're gonna think, why didn't we think about that? You know, why were our expectations so low? So, uh, I, you know, our expectations, our biases, our stereotypes, they impact everything we do as professionals or even in, in a family support role. And what we have to understand is that those expectations may be as big a barrier to living rich, full lives as anything else. And that it's incumbent upon us to do what we can to put our expectations aside and to be able to work toward goals that are driven by the person uh, who, who, with whom we're working, by the, the wishes and the dreams and the hopes of those families and not just by what is currently happening in the community because I will assure you that what is currently happening uh, is not best practice in, in, in most cases. So, so um, and for the rest of our time here together, I'm going to ask that you kind of 
not suspend belief. That sounds, you know, always be skeptical of anyone that suggests you suspend belief for a moment about anything. But I want you to, to try and, and put aside what you know about people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and what you might expect based upon what you know. Because a in large measure, what we have to do is begin to change how we and how our society understands the experience of disability at a very fundamental level. And in so doing, I think we're, we're going to, to come across the fact that both we can get to that point by a focus on issues of self-determination and that it is consistent with ways of thinking about disability.